it's great to see everybody. Just by way of introduction and scene setting, as part of the 2023-2024 uh, Healthy Ageing Work, we, Think Active and Partners, have delivered two Live Longer Better webinars that have highlighted the various areas of, act, of the active ageing agenda. So this afternoon, on behalf of Active Warwickshire, which I'll talk about in a minute, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this, our third webinar, as well as being Chief Exec of Think Active. I'm also the current Chair of Active Warwickshire. Active Warwickshire is a network which brings partners together to strategically influence the physical activity agenda with the goal of increasing physical activity in Warwickshire, reducing inequalities. So at this point, just a, a shout out and a thanks to colleagues from the Active Warwickshire group who recommended this subject and recommended Michael to be made available to wider colleagues. I think it's a really important agenda. The Active Warwickshire is a network of partners that are working together to promote consistent messages to influence and advocate how physical activity can play a key role in reducing health inequalities and to increase physical activity levels. One of the straightforward and simple reasons why is last year, Professor Sir Chris Whitty, so the Chief Medical Officer, made the statement and quote, Making it easy and attractive for people to exercise throughout their lives is one of the most effective ways of maintaining independence into older age. And that was in the Chief Medical Officer Report in 2023, which was Health in an Ageing Society. Additionally, and previous to that, in 2021, there's a bit of a game-changing consensus statement that was released nationally that went to dispel the perceptions about physical activity being dangerous and trying to dispel notions like rest is best for treatment of health conditions and, and getting older. So the consensus statement states that physical activity is safe even for people living with symptoms of multiple long-term conditions and that regular physical activity in combination with standard medical care has an important role in the management and prevention of many long-term conditions. Recently, directly connected to this and this agenda, Warwick Public Health published their latest Older Adults Joint Strategic Needs Assessment, which you see on the screen abbreviated to JSNA. And their JSNA manager, Michael Maddox, is presenting key aspects of this JSNA on, on today's webinar. So, Michael, on behalf of both Think Active, Active Warwick, and I'm sure every, all the attendees are welcome and thanks to you for sharing your insights and expertise. We look forward to hearing from you. And just lastly, Think Active's role on the webinar will be to champion the um, and to dispel these myths around physical activity being dangerous and rest is best and actually helping people to be more confident around the fact that physical activity can play a role, a safe role in everybody's life. And we, as the webinar goes on, we'll showcase some examples and case studies. So thank you again to Michael and welcome. Thank you, Jordan and the team and enjoy everybody. Thank you, Vicky, for the introduction. And thank you for having me here to talk about the Healthy Ageing JSNA. Um, the presentation I'm going to go through today is going to explore some of the links to physical activity and active lifestyles that are made within this JSNA. I've just popped in the chat a website link and a code. I am, there, there are aspects of this presentation which are interactive to get you to engage and think about some of the data that I'm, I'm going to be presenting on. I will give instructions of when you need to jump on that link and use that code. There will also be a QR code I'll have up, which um, you can join on your phone if you prefer, but just to have that there ready for when we get to that, that part of the presentation. I'm going to start though with what is a JSNA, because I appreciate this might be the first time some of you have come across Joint Strategic Needs Assessment, so to explain their role um, within our health and care system. So Joint Strategic Needs Assessments are reviews of health and care needs and the strengths of the population, and they provide an evidence base to support the commissioning and delivery of service, as well as to inform strategic action, highlight inequalities and all of those sorts of things. And there are statutory responsibility of our health and wellbeing boards, and these are boards that are made up of a number of partners across the health and care system as well as um, elected members from the council meaning that in their ownership of this it's a tool for the whole system to use and consider and respond to not just us at, at Warwickshire County Council. Finally on this Warwickshire creates themed JSNA so what we mean by this is we pick a population of focus or a condition of focus and we look at either that population or that condition across the whole of, uh, of, of Warwickshire and we use a prioritisation process to decide on the work programme. What is our healthy ageing JSNA then? So this was prioritised as part of our 2022 
JSNA prioritization process and was the first needs assessment that we've carried out from that. The aim is to understand the needs and the assets of the older population in Warwickshire and it's going into supporting the commissioning of services as well as some of the delivery and wider strategic action across the system. The JSNA aims to reflect that healthy ageing is not defined by a set age and that actually there's things we can consider for healthy ageing throughout our life course but also that some people may live well into their 60s, 70s in good health and so we try to have an aim that we reflect this. However, we do have to at some points take an age bracket for analysis purposes. And where we have done that, quite often we've used a 65-plus age bracket purely for analysis purposes. We aligned this Healthy Aging JSNA to the Healthy Aging Consensus Statement, which is a set of five principles which you can see on the left there, which when worked towards, the aim is that it enables people to live happier, healthier and longer lives. So these five principles are putting prevention first and ensuring timely access to services and support, removing barriers and creating more opportunities, ensuring good homes and communities, narrowing inequalities and challenging ageist and negative language, culture and practices. The Chief Medical Officer's report has already been mentioned as part of the introduction, but just to highlight it again that this JSNA comes at a very timely point alongside this Chief Medical Officer's report as local data intelligence and evidence that can be used to drive forward the healthy ageing agenda. We did two pieces of engagement work that went into the JSNA as alongside our usual data collection and analysis that we do. The first was a series of stories circles, which are focus group style sessions that encourage conversation around specific questions in order to understand meaning. And these were run by compassionate communities at UHCW. And there were 10 sessions that were spread across Warwickshire. The second part was a survey that was live from August to mid-September, and we received 440 responses to that. The aim of both engagement pieces was try to understand experiences of growing older and what it's like to live in Warwickshire as, as an older person. The JSNA covered a range of very broad topics. We covered population demographics, we covered different mental and physical health conditions, we covered different risk factors in, in healthy ageing, we covered wider determinants of health, and in total ended at about 170 pages. Having done this, we then challenged ourselves to try and summarise this JSNA in four sentences and four key points that if you're going to take away nothing else from the healthy ageing JSNA, this is what we want you to think about. The first is that the older population is large and growing. We have seen it increase since the 2011 census and projections indicate that it's going to continue increasing. The second is that as we age, we are more likely to be living with health conditions and have care needs. The third is that prevention is key. And I want to split this into three areas to think about. The first being a life course approach and how we can think about conditions and things that impact older people and actually how we can start to mitigate against those and support those in earlier life. The second is different types of prevention. So prevention, of course, being how do we stop people getting conditions, but actually thinking as well, once people are developing conditions, how can we get them uh, the earliest support or how can we ensure that their conditions don't become barriers to services, community life and things like that. And the third is around the wider determinants of health and how our social, cultural, economic world around us can impact our, our health needs. And the fourth is that we need to reframe attitudes to ageing and recognise and build on strength. Strengths. And the key point here really is that health should be um, an enabler for older people to do what they like in later life, not older people defined by their ill health or, or their health status. So having set the scene a little bit, at this point I'm going to ask you to indulge me by um, either going to www.menti.com and entering the code there below or scanning the QR code and joining on your phone. I thought rather than just talking data at you for, for 25 minutes or so, I'd try to encourage you to reflect on what the picture of healthy ageing is um, by making it a bit more interactive, asking some questions that we can think about it before I then sort of explain some of the bits with data. So I'm going to start off with a bit of population context for healthy ageing and considering how the population dem or what the population demographics are within Warwickshire, such as things like how many of our older people, how many of our population are older people, how we expect this to change in the upcoming years. And in the spirit of making it a bit more interactive and, and getting you to reflect on what the picture might look like, I'm going to start with three statements about the population and I want you to decide whether these are true or false. So on your screen and on the shared screen, hopefully three statements have popped up. 
The first is that one in six of the Warwickshire population is age 65 plus. The second is that by 2033, one in four of the Warwickshire population will be age 65 plus. And the third is that projections indicate that by 2043, the 90 plus population will have increased by 60%. So the first statement, one in six of the Warwickshire population is age 65 plus, that is actually false. It's one in five of the population is currently 65 plus, around 20%. Um, for the second question, that is correct. By 2033, we anticipate one in four of the Warwickshire population will be age 65 plus, which is an increase of approximately 30,000 people. And the final one, projections indicate that by 2043, the 90 plus population will have increased by 60 percent. That is actually false. The 90 plus population by 2043 is predicted to increase by 125 percent. And we can see this a little bit more here. So um, the, the key point here is that key point about uh, or key point one from the previous slide. The population has been increasing and the table in the top left shows the comparison between the mid 2011 census and the mid 2021 census and the percentage change we've seen across the county. And we expect it to keep on growing. And when we say keep on growing, we're particularly talking the 90 plus age category in the 75 to 89 year old age category, which we can see in the bottom left. Impacts of the growing population will happen across the county, but we also acknowledge that there are some areas where we have a higher proportion of older residents than others. And you can see a little bit of that in the map in the top right, where those darker areas are higher population density. I also want to draw out at this point that national evidence suggests that the prevalence of multimorbidity, that being people with two or more long term health conditions, is predicted to increase um, up until 2035. And that's where the graph in the bottom right comes in. And you can see that split across different age groups um, and that increase. This growing population, coupled with the increase in multimorbidity prevalence, highlights the importance of how we start thinking about risk factors and, and what we can do to help this population age in a healthy way, especially considering this, this large growth. I'm going to highlight a few of the themes on physical activity that... Um, that, that we recognise in the Healthy Ageing JSNA. As part of considering what is supportive to health in the JSNA, we recognise the importance of physical activity, both in supporting physical health, as well as those links to mental health and wellbeing. Part of this includes the positive impact physical activity can have on the prevention of health conditions that are particularly prevalent in older people, which leads me on to my next question for you to consider, and that is, physical activity can reduce the chance of type 2 diabetes. Is it by 25% or is it by 40%? So the correct answer is 40%, which is a, a very large percentage. And I'm going to highlight, first of all, in the top right of this visual, the little, um, the little table that we've got, which shows the benefits that physical activity can have for older adults, both in terms of, sort of the benefits of health, improving sleep, helping maintain a well, healthy weight and things like that, but also importantly, the reduction in your chance of developing or delaying the onset of several health conditions which can particularly impact older people. Some of the data around levels of inactivity I think may have been touched on earlier, but it presents to us a challenge about how we can support older people to be able to be active and get all of these, all of these great benefits for having physical activity or active lifestyles as part of their lives. Responses to both our Healthy Ageing in Warwickshire survey as well as our story circles found that a lot of respondents and people we engaged with identified keeping active and physical activity as important to them. And there was a lot of praise when people were able to access services for the services they were accessing. However, several barriers were identified, including accessibility, affordability, safety, age appropriateness and cost. I'm going to, um, and these are demonstrated, by the way, in some of the quotes at the bottom there. I'm going to pull out some of these themes in a moment to explore what the Healthy Ageing JSNA can tell us about these barriers and what they might look like. But just before I go into that, I wanted to very quickly highlight some data relating to healthy weight from the JSNA, sort of acknowledging the close link between physical activity and healthy weight, which leads me on to my next question, which is nationally in females, which age category has the highest percentage of people overweight or obese? And what you should be able to do on your laptop or your um, or your phone is be able to order these age categories into which you think has 
the most or which you think has the least and everything in between. This is almost right what we've got, except the 65 to 74 age range is actually highest in terms of uh, for females, which category has the highest percentage of people overweight or obese. And we can see that in the graph on the left, the top one being for females, where we have in the 65 to 74 year old age category, 71% of females in that, in that category. For males, that's 76%. Um, although slightly higher in the 45 to 54 year age age role, uh, age category. We can use this to estimate numbers in Warwickshire, which give just shy of 20,000 um, women who uh, are age 65 plus and who may be obese, and just over 15,000 men who, who are also in that category. Once again, highlighting that link between lots of different health conditions, and again, just highlighting and acknowledging the link between levels of physical activity and obesity, as well as those links with overweight and obese to loneliness and social isolation, starting to think of that knock on effect uh, within health conditions. At this point, I'm going to go on to sort of thinking about some of the barriers to being active and thinking about some of the themes earlier in the slides and, and some of the impacts of them. So I'm going to cover things and thinking about cost and finances, some thinking about transport, digital exclusion and impact of health conditions. And I'm going to start this with a question around cost and finances, thinking about pension credit. Cost can be a barrier to being active. Within Warwickshire in 2019, how much unclaimed pension credit was there estimated to be? The options are either 3.4 million, 15.6 million, 22.3 million, and 48.9 million. The eagle-eyed of the eagle-eyed of you um, back on the key point slide might have spotted the answer, which I only realised after I did this question. And the answer is 22.3 million. Um, 3.4 million, incidentally, is uh, one of the totals for one of the constituencies within Warwickshire. But uh, it's Warwickshire for a total, it's 22.3 million. Just thinking this through then as an, a barrier around affordability. Affordability for physical activity and active lifestyles was in, raised in engagement as a barrier. Money in general can be a concern for older people and part of this is pension increases often incur at the end of the financial year, meaning that costs can increase before income increases. We have some national examples of this concern, including surveys showing that older people are worried about heating their homes, affording essentials, as well as a link with relative poverty increasing with alongside age. And this sort of all mixes to a point about ensuring that we're considering cost implications and how we can support older people access physical activity and active lifestyles. But in addition, I also want to raise a point linking back to that uptake of um, pension credit. And this is almost a making every compact, contact count opportunities to promote support while we have contact with older people. And if I just use this unpaid pension credit as an example, in 2019, it was identified that only 55.8% of pension credit was being claimed. And some of the common barriers here included lack of awareness, people assuming they're not eligible, digital barriers and language barriers, which leads us to the 22.3 million predicted unclaimed. It's therefore an extra thought for us in terms of when we have these interactions with older people, are there ways that we can use it as this sort of making every contact count to ensure people are getting the support they're able to and in itself then supporting people to, to, to address these barriers. So I'm going to move on to transport and issues accessing transport can be a potential barrier. We had in our Healthy Ageing in Warwickshire survey lots of themes around transport in terms of concerns expressed about it. And before I go into some of the detail on that, I'd just be interested to hear what you think these barriers and concerns that people expressed might be. So I think you should have an opportunity to type in a couple of words or something onto the screen and just be interesting to see what we think already these barriers might look like. It's looking like cost is quite a popular one in the middle, perhaps still ringing from our thought thinking around affordability and pension credits on the previous slide. But a lot of the themes that we're drawing out here are absolutely um, the themes that were coming out of our survey, so things around accessibility and that both being in terms of where these transport options are but actually accessing information about them and, and that sort of link to digital exclusion. Reliability, rural access particularly when we think about reliability and, and the options, lack of service and things like that. So I, th I think we're all thinking on a on a really good good line here. So Issues accessing transport can be a potential barrier to physical activity and active lifestyles. And this from sort of two perspectives. The first is 
access getting to opportunities, but also that link between active lifestyles, active travel and transport in terms of it, it all as an enabler. We also in the JSNA highlight certain populations who this may be a particularly prevalent issue for, and this includes those with a disability, those living in rural areas, those without easy access to public transport, and those aged 66 plus who are in one person households. And the reason we mention these people is they're the people who are less likely to own a car or van, and therefore more reliant on public transport. We, as mentioned, we asked in the Healthy Aging JSNA about um, how transport met the needs of older people in the local area, and 45.8% of respondents either disagreed or strongly disagreed that it met these needs with some of those themes that we, we've already identified coming out. So thinking about transport as a barrier and how we can address this is another way that, um, that, that it can be supportive. My next question is moving on to around digital exclusion, and the question is nationally, older people are less likely to have internet access at home. What percentage of people aged 75 plus don't have access to the internet? And you should be able to um, scroll along, select a percentage you think somewhere between 0 to 30. Um, I'll give you 30 seconds again, and then I'll um, the correct answer is 26%. So a few of us slightly higher than that, um, few of us just slightly lower. How we promote advertising, encourage people to, uh, to, to sign up um, and how we do that digitally or only doing it digitally may impact whether older people are able to access. Older people are a group nationally identified as being the least likely to have access to the internet at home with 26% of those aged 75 plus and 8% of those aged 65 to 74 not having internet access at home. This again was a big theme from our engagement, and this often included concern about the move towards technology, not being able to access information without being online, technology reducing some of those face-to-face -face interactions, technology being more challenging for those with comorbidities, and it being an access, a barrier to accessing amenities and services. So again, a point about how we can consider the use of technology in supporting non-digital alternatives in order to encourage people to um, to take part in physical activity. And then I think this is my final question you might be rela relieved to hear. Um, and this is moving on to starting to think about impact of health conditions. So the question is nationally, what percentage of people registered as blind or partially sighted are age 65 plus? And once again, just 30 seconds to have a think about that. Once again, response is slowing down. I think this one might surprise a few of us. So it's actually 80%. Um, uh, of, of people registered as blind or partially sighted are aged 65 plus. So as well as preventing people from entering ill health, and this is relating to sort of some of those prevention messages, we can also think about how we can support people with health conditions to ensure that does not become a barrier. And I'm going to use an example of visual impairment, but this can apply to lots of other things such as hearing loss or, or mobility issues and similar. So within that visual impairment, we have that 80% um, in that 65 plus population. And in 2020 within Warwickshire, it was estimated that there were just shy of 11,000 people with moderate or severe sight loss aged 85 plus. Wider impacts of visual impairment can include things like other health conditions, difficulty engaging in day-to-day -day activities and problems with mobility. And at the bottom, using examples in the JSNA, I've tried to map out just very simply some of the potential impacts to try and highlight how appropriate condition support and management can enable someone to keep on being active. So the idea being that if an individual experiences visual impairment, research and evidence tells us they may be less likely to leave the house, that has a knock-on effect in terms of being less likely to, to take in, partake in physical activity, feeling more socially isolated and lonely, and opportunities for us to be able to support people um, so that, that there aren't these negative knock-on effects. So to round things up, I'm just going to talk very quickly about some of the implications. We've pulled out some of the links in the Healthy Aging JSNA to physical activity within these slides, but again, I just want to acknowledge that the JSNA was very broad and there's lots that can be considered which will link to physical activity. And with this in mind, I've just got a couple of slides trying to draw out some of these implications for us to consider. And I've structured these around um, the four key messages that uh, that we discussed at the beginning. So the first around the older adult population and 
the, the, the key thought linked to our recommendation and findings is to make sure we're thinking about the age profile of our users and assess how changes in the Warwickshire population will impact that. The second around as we age, we are more likely to be living with health conditions and have care needs. And here it's thinking about how these conditions will impact and ensuring they don't become barriers to service. Um, but also how we can consider how we can support those with health needs to be active. Third around prevention. Um, the first part is considering prevention as part of all services and looking at ways to opportunities to prevent, identify and manage conditions. Also around partner organisations in encouraging unpaid carers to recognise their carer status. It's not something I've drawn out particularly in this presentation, but actually a lot of evidence suggesting that as we get older, we're less likely to identify ourselves as carers and that then leads on to miss, miss support. Routinely assessing the impact of inequalities as well as supporting older people to claim benefits they are entitled to and using pension credit as an example. And then for the fourth point, I've got one more slide um, to, to think about some cross-cutting recommendations, but I also highlight one of our recommendations about exploring the age-friendly employer pledge or otherwise review how age-friendly we are or as organisations to promote um, older people and support older people in employment and, and contribution. So just the final bit on implications around cross-cutting recommendations. These were some recommendations we made in the JSNA that were all themes from our engagement about ways we can consider approaching these recommendations or actually just working with older people in general. And these include thinking about our messages, ensuring that they're age-friendly language and imagery, Barriers to services and community life are considered. We're thinking about prevention. We're ensuring people can contribute in ways such as volunteering and thinking about how we can do things intergenerationally. When these slides are circulated afterwards, I've included a couple of links for use, including to where our JSNA is, as well as a few other resources. I'll mention that the Age Friendly Image Library or Age Positive Image Library is where I've got all of the images for today, which included older people and a great resource of free images for you to be able to use. And if you have any questions about the Healthy Aging JSNA, Warwickshire JSNA programme, or if you would like the Healthy Aging JSNA presented at any group meeting, then please feel free to email me and I'm more than happy to support with any or all of that. Just thanks again, Michael, for, for giving up your time to come and share that with us today. I think it's really useful and um, quite quite positive I think for us to see that there's there's findings that quite really align with with our messaging and something that I'm definitely really keen just to share some more about the physical activity elements now and hopefully kind of bring bring to life why why we want all this stuff coming together so um thanks again Michael so I guess in terms of our, our approach to physical activity and, and why we feel like it's so important in this space is physical activity gives us so much stuff so being physically active is 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 good for our health throughout our lives and, and I know Michael touched on that there's a life course element to developing an active lifestyle and creating the conditions to be active but w when we look at it through that lens of, of people getting older physical activity can do so much for us it can help us maintain our mobility and our functional independence in older age and help reduce risk of falls and um, it reduces the risk of developing major conditions or diseases or, or can help manage those symptoms it has a real key benefit around our mental health and our well-being it gives us some structure and purpose. Being physically active can also help reduce social isolation and really contribute to, to a vibrant community and wherever that may be. And, and I guess ultimately what we're really trying to achieve is increasing the number of years spent in good health. And, and the more we can do that, then hopefully the, the less pressure we can put on the health system and, and kind of people can get access to the services that they need. Um, just a, a note on, on something that Michael touched on just towards the end there, in terms of you'll see some positive imagery throughout this presentation around older people being active as well. And that's something that we're really keen to, to continue to champion is that when we talk about older people being active, we showcase some really good imagery and a range of imagery that shows older people being active in different in different ways. So for example, the, the group on screen there is a, it's a warm hub act a warm hub um, who are doing some seated exercise and you, you know some of the pom-poms on the floor because they were doing a little bit of cheerleading as well so I, I've sadly never been to that group myself but I think I would never I never escape I think I absolutely love hearing the stories from from that group Um just following on from that in terms of setting the scene as to the, the challenges we face in terms of encouraging older people to be active and and the JSNA is, as Michael touched on explores a number of those factors but I guess our, our our social construct doesn't really help either. So the modern day environment, there's a, a, a negative attitude or wrong belief around as people get older, do do less, we'll do more and care for our families more. And, and actually, you actually stop older people being as active as, as they could be. 
our society as cars, technology, desk jobs, just make it so easy to be inactive, as well as how easy it is to access kind of mass calorie consumption. And all of those things kind of really skew the the balance in, in favour, you know, of people spending longer time in ill health with poorer physical and mental health and a loss of fitness. And, and that's the kind of the, the cycle that we're we're trying to break ultimately. Now, through a Warwickshire lens, um, the, the latest Active Lives data kind of tells us that 48% of um, people aged 55 plus are not meeting physical activity guidelines in Warwickshire, which is larger than the national average of 44%, which kind of puts us in a, in a position where it gives us a bit of a, a challenge. It, it kind of highlights the size of the prize, really, in terms of what we can go after. That number in terms of actual people equates to 101,100 people. So that's a, that's a fair amount of people that, that are not meeting those guidelines. More, I, I think, which, which, which brings to life is that actually of those 101,000, 76,400 are actually inactive. So they're doing 29 minutes or less moderate activity per week, which I think really highlights the, the size of the opportunity if we can start to look through back, look through the lens of this JSNA and through how we can help people be physically active, like how much more we can achieve kind of collectively in, in our own roles and our own communities to help people be more active. Now, just to give you a bit of a picture across our, our whole area of Cornish Solar Hall and Warwickshire, this isn't a, a, something that's isolated just to Warwickshire. As you see here, it's kind of split by local authority, but um, most recently is actually that in the 75 to 84 age group, the most inact are the most inactive group across Cornish Hall and Solihull and Warwickshire, which equates to about 47,700 people ac across our region. So, and what we have seen is actually, while the national activity level in this age group is increasing, we're actually seeing it decrease in, in our area. So again, it's just why if we can highlight the importance of being active and ultimately the local picture of what it is like, is that we can kind of hopefully go, do you know, actually there's a real benefit to being physically active the numbers aren't in our favor at the moment so how can we all collectively address those so i guess the, the key message is if we could leave people with anything around physical activity uh, are these five key messages really and um as vicky touched on in, in our open address in the 2021 kind of consensus statement which looked at the risk of physical activity it is written in there that the benefits of taking part in physical activity outweigh the risks of for people with long-term health conditions of not being active and that could be inactivity doesn't help the condition at all or the fact that like by kind of that rest is best approach really isn't the the approach that we actually we need to be taking um the statement kind of helps us confirm that physical activity is safe and an activity can look different for different people but it is safe even for people living with symptoms of multiple long-term conditions and that's something just and there's emerging piece of work at the moment around uh, needing sign off for activity and actually a lot of people in the majority of cases are able to access physical activity I think it's really important to flag that it's never too late to start gaining the health benefits. So whether you're you're active from 20 years all the way through your life, or even you know if you start being active at age 60, 65, 70, it's never too late to start gaining those health benefits. Now, number four is is, is my personal favourite, um, and it's something that I I would advocate for more than anything else. But everyone has their own starting point, and that could be someone who's been really active or someone who's been not active at all. And we'll touch on it in the next slide, but even just a little bit, if you're doing nothing, then do a little bit. If you're doing a little bit, can you do a little bit more? And if we can personalise that approach to physical activity, that people can start at their own pace at whatever challenge level that they feel appropriate, then that is a super positive step for us. Um, the final point is, is just to come back to it, that people should stop and seek medical attention if they experience a dramatic increase in their symptoms, that that is still that is still the case. We wouldn't advise anything else, but just to keep that in mind, I'm not just saying just go and be active regardless. But if there are there is an increase in symptoms, then absolutely seek a healthcare professional. And I think what underpins that is this here. So for me, any amount of physical activity is better than none. So if you can only manage a couple of minutes a day, start with that. It's absolutely better for you than doing absolutely no minutes. And that's a message that we'll hopefully continue championing throughout the next the next year. And actually, research shows us that the greatest health gains actually come from someone moving from being physically inactive or low active status so more physically active status so if we think back that there's 76,400 people who are potentially in a position where they stand to gain the greatest health gains from starting to be active if we can collectively encourage and create the conditions for them to be um, more active the converse of that is actually that being inactive is harmful to health so 
while we're championing physical activity, it's the opposite, which also gives us a mandate that if people are inactive, that can be harmful to their health as well. And being active can come in a number of different ways, really. It could be through their day-to-day -day activity, walking, brisk walking, gardening, just everyday activities that, that they can do, whether it be through organised groups or activities, sports clubs or leisure centres or, or, or anywhere in between, and then ex exercise on referral um, as well. So there's a number of ways which are, are quite straightforward in terms of people being physically active. And just before I finish, I was just really like to share a couple of examples now um the first one is mike and linda here on the screen so mike and linda are in their their 80s and, and they're still playing badminton down at thorbank badminton club um it kind of celebrated some examples where they're able to keep fit make friends and they feel like being at, can continue to be active has helped with their well-being and, and feeling in good condition um, and mike actually recently ran uh, the regency 10k in leamington so um in, in terms of these examples here just to kind of give us some idea of, of what different people have done to stay active. Um, the next example is um, Sky Blues in the community. who run a dementia active program. They run a variety of, um, of, of different activities at their sessions, which in, um, allow people to uh, maintain their physical, cognitive and emotional health. Uh, activities from table tennis to badminton, walking football, archery, and uh, their, their most competitive uh, activity they run is actually the Jenga um, activity. But actually, what they've talked about is that, again, that com that community connection, um, making friends, a social opportunity, as well as being active and the, and the wider benefits that that brings to it. Um, if we're going to share a story about Barbara, um, in 2017, Barbara fell down the stairs and actually fractured a C2 and C3 vertebrae. Um, she actually started getting back to, to walking using the Neaton and Bedworth Borough Council's rehab walks at Pingles. Um, she actually now... 9% use of her arms and 95% use of her legs. And actually, most inspiration was that Barbara now um, leads a walking group at Pingles. So not only has Barbara benefited from physical activity, Barbara now champions um, physical activity for other people like her in her community. Um, and last but not least is a, is a slightly less sporting example, but um, North Warwickshire 50 plus club, um, which actually is started as a warm hub. Um, a couple of their session leaders attended our Live Longer Better conference in um, about this time last year and, and left so inspired that they actually continued to deliver physical activity elements at their club, actually reported some of their most popular activities that they do. So some of their favourite activities that they reported are um, aerobics, tai chi and, and yoga um, and, and are continuing to deliver that today. And I guess the reason I bring those to you is to highlight a campaign that, that we have here at Think Active, which is our moving stories. And I think why I, I probably try, I try to get through them so quickly, but so passionately is that these are just a really small example of, of a wide range of people who are able to be active uh, through older age. And I think that if we can showcase more of these examples, celebrate people who are active through um, whatever life you know, life stage they're at, whatever health condition they have, people are still able to access physical activity in, in, in their way and in a way that's suitable for them and in a way that's sustainable and, and hopefully keeps them active for for as long as possible um so for me um just a final thing to to plug before i, I open the floor to q a but actually you can find out some more um about uh our moving stories and a national campaign called we are undefeatable and how that all fits together at our next uh, webinar we're actually running it on tuesday the 19th of march 11 30 till 12 30 um you can register using the qr code here the link to register will also be sent in the in the follow-up to this i have given a bit of a whistle stop tour there i probably gave myself more to talk about than i'd i thought thought i could do in 10 minutes but what i would like to do now is just open the floor really to questions and that could be for um for michael around the jsna or, or for myself but the, the the couple of bits i'd be really interested in terms of um number one like what stands out for you like what has stood out from the from the things you you may have heard today or potentially what might you go and do next or what might you think about in your in your practice so whether you want to share it in the chat or just come off camera come off mic and just and, and shout out we'd really welcome a couple of thoughts before we before we close far away it's just really sharing what i do i'm 55 years old and um i've got cerebral palsy and um a couple of years ago i started noticing a difference in my walking and i was frightened that i was going to fall over so I, I joined the gym i started swimming started having issues with my disability with the swimming um so i 
went to, well, a long story, but I basically started classes. So I now do chair fit and aquatherapy twice a week and have joined the joint pain management programme at Nuffield too. And I've really noticed a difference. It's really, honestly, it's really made a difference beyond what I was going to expect. So I just wanted to share that. Fantastic. And thanks for sharing, Nikki. And it might be something that we might reach out and tell your moving story if that's if that would be something that you would be, be keen to do. Yeah, that's fine. Amazing. Thank you, Nikki. I'll definitely follow up on that. Um, does anybody have any questions to... Um, Oh, Reese, you've got a question. Yeah, it's more of a more of an observation than than anything, um, and it's to do with um to, with Michael JSNA. Um, at Age UK, Coventry Morsh, we play a bit of a part in it and sort of be a little bit of feedback. I'm not taking any credit for any work there; it's all Michael and his team. But um, I got to hear some of the um, stats quite early on, and even as someone who um, at Age UK, Coventry Morsh, we hear a lot of stories with local older people with being inactive and just their general health conditions. Even I was quite surprised at that and to see the projections in years to come, which ultimately are potentially going to be coming to our charity's door um, is really interesting. It makes you really sit up and take take notice. I would encourage anyone if they've got any time to also read as much of the JSNA details as they could away from this, as well as the summary. Um, there's some amazing things in there that Michael wouldn't have had an opportunity to touch on upon today. And like I said, there's some really interesting pieces there. And I think the, the moving story, Jordan, is just a great example of how um, people can incorporate activity into groups who wouldn't necessarily be devoted to solely activity. It's something that we've tried to do within our services um, over the past year or so, or a couple of years now, and taking a bit more of a responsibility for ensuring our clients are being more physically active. And a lot of them um, talk about it in a very positive way. On the recent Think Active newsletter, we shared a story about Dementia Day opportunities in the south of uh, Warwickshire, where they were able to um, they were able to take part in dancing and singing, and uh, a lot of them um, used it as a reminiscence tool to look back on when they were in their 20s, 30s and 40s, and they used to do line dancing and things. Um, but fundamentally, there is a huge physical activity element to that that um, they wouldn't have done if they were sitting at home and not taking part. So both things that have been covered today are absolutely brilliant, and I'd encourage everyone to look into the JSNA in as much detail as they can and to think about how they can have more physical activity and any people, patients, clients that they support. Yeah, thanks for thanks for that, Rhys. And I think there's there's some brilliant photos and uh, stories from your Dementia Day opportunities. Yeah, it's really, really cool. So thanks for sharing with that. And I hope people get a chance to have a read of that. And if you didn't get the newsletter, we'll include a link uh, so you can get to see that in, the, in our follow-up kind of email from today. Just before we run out of time, if I could just ask if anyone else so kind as to um, give us a bit of feedback on today's webinar, if you can scan the QR code, it shouldn't take longer than five or 10 minutes, but um, let us know what you thought, good, bad, that we can only take your learnings and improve um, the webinars that we do. And we're really, really grateful that everybody uh, jumps on and listens to this. Um, for, for me on behalf of Think Active, just to say a massive thank you again to, to Michael Maddox for his presentation today on the, on the JSNA and to Active Warwickshire for the work that they're doing in pulling partners together. Um, around this as well. So um, thank you, everybody. I think this has been a really, really good afternoon. Um, and hopefully you found it as useful as, as I did. And, and some of that data is really, really insightful. So um, I'll leave this on the screen. Um, please do take the time to share some feedback with us.